हेलो स्टूडेंट्स टुडे विल डू रिमेनिंग क्वेश्चंस ऑफ कोर्स कोर्स जीरो सिक्स टू फाइव वेरियंट टू फेबरी मार्च ट्वेंटी ट्वेंटी फाइव क्वेश्चन नंबर सिक्स इज सेइंग फिगर सिक्स पॉइंट वन शोज एन ऑब्जेक्ट ओ व्हिच इज फाइव सेंटीमीटर अवे फ्रॉम द सेंटर ऑफ थिन कन्वर्जिंग लेंस एल द फोकल लेंथ ऑफ लेंस इज थ्री सेंटीमीटर फिगर सिक्स पॉइंट वन शोज इज ड्रॉन टू अ फुल स्केल सो द डिस्टेंस बिटवीन ऑब्जेक्ट एंड लेंस इज फाइव सेंटीमीटर and the focal length is 3 cm so i'm marking focal length on both side of the lens 3 cm here from the center and 3 cm here from the center i have marked the focal length a part says on figure 6.1 label principal axis with a p on figure 6.1 place a letter x at a focal point and on figure 6.1 draw two rays from o to indicate the tip of the image produced by the lens so i am naming this principal axis as p and these two points are focal points so i am naming them x and to draw the image the line which is parallel to principal axis after reaching the lens will converge and pass through a focal point and the line which passes through center of the lens goes undeviated and this point is our image question number 4 says in table 6.1 place a tick in the right hand column next to all terms and describe the image so is image dimensioned or enlarged or inverted or real or having a same size upright or virtual so you know object is placed between focal length and twice for focal length so we can we'll see how the image between f and 2f is formed when the object is between focal length and second focal length you can see image is formed by actual meeting of lines so image is real the image is larger than the object and the image is also inverted so these are the properties so enlarged real and uh, inverted image is formed b part says the object move closer to l the new distance between l and the object is less than the focal length of the lens describe how the new image is different from the image produced in a previously the object was beyond the focal point and now we are moving our object closer to the lens and this is the new position of our lens this is between the focal point and the lens so how is the image produced when object is between focal point and the lens the image produced is not by actual meeting of the rays but they appear to meet in front of the lens so the image that is produced is virtual enlarged and upright so the new image is virtual and upright The seventh question says figure 7.1 is a scale drawing of a light wave approaching a narrow slit and the scale is 1 cm is representing 4 into 10 raised to power negative 7 meters so there are three crust which are approaching there and there is a gap over here and this gap will produce diffraction name the wave effect produced by the narrow slit so diffraction is produced by this narrow slit second part says using 7.1 determine the wavelength of the light give your answer to two significant figures so wavelength can be distance between two consecutive crust so i will measure the distance between two consecutive crust over here by using my scale so the distance is 1.2 cm on the page so i'll use the scaling which is provided 1 cm is in, equals to 4 into 10 raised to power negative 7 meters so for 1.2 cm i'll multiply both side by 1.2 So 1.2 cm is equals to 4.8 into 10 raised to power negative 7 meters. So I am writing the wavelength in the uh, region provided 4.8 into 10 raised to power negative 7 meters. Third part says on figure 7.1 draw three wave fronts that have been passed through the narrow slits. As you can see that this gap is comparable with the wavelength of the light. and the rules of diffraction says when the gap is equal to the wavelength or the gap is lesser than the wavelength the spreading of waves is very good and there are good circular patterns of diffraction obtained and wavelength before diffraction is equal to wavelength after diffraction if there is no medium change between the barrier 
and if gap is greater than the wavelength then the spreading of wave is very less and we achieve this square patterns instead of circular patterns but still wavelength before and after diffraction is same so you can see uh, over here the gap is comparable with the wavelength so we achieve these good circular patterns and see wavelength before diffraction and after diffraction is same B path says a fogum emits a sound with frequency 380 hertz the sound is heard by a ship 2.5 km away the speed of the sound in the air is 330 m per second show that the wavelength of the sound is approximately equal to 0.9 m state any equation you use in words or symbol so we have following information we have frequency distance velocity of sound and we need to find wavelength so we can use wave equation v equals to frequency times wavelength so wavelength would be equals to speed over frequency speed is 330 and frequency is 380 so the wavelength would be 0.868 or approximately equal to 0.9 meter Second question says calculate the time it takes for the sound to travel ship from the fog so for the time we have the equation distance over speed but there is mismatch between the units of distance and speed distance is in kilometers so we need to convert it into meter so 2.5 kilometer can be multiplied by 1000 to get the answer in meter so it is 2500 meter so distance is 2500 and the speed is 330 meter per second dividing them both the time is 7.57 or you can say 7.6 seconds Question number 8 says figure 8.1 shows a metal rod suspended in a magnetic field produced by a pair of permanent magnets the metal rod is connected to a cell and there is current in the metal rod so this metal rod is connected by a cell to provide current inside magnetic bars state the direction of force on the metal due to the current so the magnetic field is in this direction and you know current flows from positive to negative so this is the direction of current and for force we'll use fleming's left hand rule keep your forefinger middle finger and thumb mutually perpendicular your forefinger will represent the direction of magnetic field middle finger will represent the direction of current and thumb will uh, tell you the direction of force so force is downward So answer is the direction of force is downward because according to Fleming's left hand rule if the magnetic field is towards right current is into the page so force is downward B path says the connections to a cell are reversed state this change affects the force on metal rod so if we reverse the direction of cell we reverse the direction of current and if current is reversed the force would be reversed so force will be upward in this case C part says two magnets and a cell are used to make a simple electrical motor in figure 8.2 describe the function of J K L and M so J is helping to connect the split rings and the circuit this M is a split ring and it is used to reverse the direction of current after every half cycle to keep the coil rotating so this is worked for reversing the direction of current Now the K is a coil and this coil provides the loop for the current or completes the circuit for the current to keep flowing and this L is an axle and it helps to transfer the energy produced in motor to the devices where it is being used I have written all the things with detail over here Ninth question is saying strontium 90 is a radioactive isotope of strontium the nuclide notation of strontium is this A part says explain what is isotope to represent any atom over this side we write atomic number and it rep represents the number of protons that are present in a neutral atom and over here we write mass number or nucleon number it represents the number of proton and neutron in an atom to get the number of neutron only we subtract z from a or mass number from atomic number and number of electron are always equal to number of proton in a neutral atom we define isotopes with elements having same number of protons and different number of neutrons second question is saying complete table 9.1 for strontium 90 here we have particles number in an atom and location 
So outside the nucleus, we only have one element, which is electron. The number of electron is similar to number of protons. So this is surely num uh, protons and they are present inside the nucleus. So protons and uh, neutron, the number of neutron can be get by subtracting mass number from atomic number. So 90 subtracted from 38 will give you number of neutron, which is 52. And they are also present inside the nucleus. P part says strontium 90 is used to measure the thickness of metal sheets in industry. Strontium 90 decay by emitting beta particles which pass through metal sheet to a detector. One metal sheet is 0.75 mm thick. Suggest why strontium 90 is a suitable radioactive source to measure the thickness of metal sheet. Because beta particles penetrate through metal sheets easily than alpha particles and they are also less ionizing than uh, gamma particles. So they are suitable. Second question says half-life of strontium-90 is approximately 27 years. Figure shows a shape of decay curve. Here we have percentage of strontium-90 remaining and here we have age of a sample. The strontium-90 source is replaced by a new source after every 15 years. Using figure 9.1 suggests why strontium-90 source that is more than 15 year old be replaced with new source. Because if the strontium get old, its radioactivity or decay rate is reduced after 15 years and less beta particles cannot measure the thickness of metal sheets effectively. Tenth question says figure 10.1 shows a part of earth as it orbits the sun. X is the position on earth where scientists observe the apparent motion of the sun through the air. So here we have sun, earth is orbiting uh, with its tilt and uh, this is the position x where the scientists are measuring the apparent motion. Determine how many days it takes the earth to move around its orbit from f to g and explain your answer. So how many days it take earth from reach f to g? And you know, Earth takes 365 days for complete orbit and this is one-fourth of the Earth's orbit. So 1 over 4 times 365. So it takes approximately 92 days for Earth to go from F to G. So 92 days because it is a quarter distance of complete Earth orbit which takes 365 days. B part says 10.1 shows four position E, F, G, H of the Earth in its orbit of the Sun. Identify the position of Earth where, when it's summer at X and when it is winter at X. So at point E, the, the Earth is tilted in a way that the rays of Sun are reaching directly at X. So it is summer at X. And at position G, the Sun rays cannot reach the, this point directly. So there is winter at G. C part says the orbital speed of Earth around the Sun is approximately 3 into 10 raised to power 4 meter per second. Calculate the average radius of Earth's orbit. Orbital speed is written as V equals to 2 pi r over t. r is the radius of orbit and t is the time for one orbit. I'll rearrange the equation with respect to radius. V is 3 into 10 raised to power 4. The time for one complete orbit for Earth is 365 days, but we need it in seconds. So I'll convert 365 in seconds, which is equals to 31536000 seconds. Putting all the values in the equation, value of uh, velocity, time and uh, the value of pi is 3.14. So the radius of uh, the orbit is 1.5 into 10 raised to power 11 meter. D says Earth is a planet in solar system. State one other type of naturally occurring object in solar system. So stars and comets appear in solar system naturally. Thanks for watching the video. If it was helpful, please hit the like button and subscribe my channel.